Uh, welcome to the Council for British Research in the Levant's uh, latest webinar. Um, as folks uh, collect in the room uh, and hopefully get themselves comfortable, let me do some of my customary introductions. Um, we have over 120 different people today who have signed up for this event today. Today we will be uh, uh, taking the Jerusalem book launch of History of False Hope by Dr. Lori Allen is taking place today uh, from the Kenyan Institute in East Jerusalem. And we are doing this webinar in partnership with our, uh, our friends from the Educational Bookshop on Salah Hadin Street, also in, in East Jerusalem. Uh, the Council for British Research in the Levant is an independent UK research charity and membership organization that exists to conduct support and promote humanities and social science research on the Levant. We're one of eight different British international research institutes and we have over a hundred different years in the region, including from Jerusalem, uh, where we used to act as the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. And we have a sister organization, which, uh, which is called the British Institute of Amman. And together we, we constitute the Council for British Research in the Levant, who are bringing you this webinar today. Um, so that's sort of my spiel on the, the, who is hosting this. I hope everybody is comfortable now and uh, we, we're ready to start. So this is going to be a Zoom webinar that is also being broadcast live on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, both by ourselves and hopefully by the Educational Bookshop as well. Uh, if you would like, the way it's going to be organized is we're going to have a, around a 25 minute, 30 minute presentation by Dr. Lori Allen and uh, followed up by around 25 minute set of questions from myself. And then we'll be taking audience questions, the questions from the audience, which I ask you to uh, put in the question and answer feature on the Zoom. Uh, in the Zoom room, uh, and uh, we will not be checking uh, anything on the chat menu today. So questions, please, in the Zoom room, and just try and be uh, succinct with your questions because it's not always so easy to juggle complicated questions uh, when you're live <laughs> on a webinar, but we'll do our best, and we'll do our best to get as many uh, questions up there as possible. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our speaker today who has written uh, this book, which I'm very excited that we're actually having the Jerusalem book launch for. And I was very uh, keen to see and read it when, when I heard about it. The book is A History of False uh, Hope, uh, Investigative Commissions of, of, in Palestine by Dr. Lori Allen, who is a reader in anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Her work has focused on Palestinian society, politics, and history. And she's the author of two books, both A History of False Hope, this, her latest one from Stanford University Press, as well as a previous volume entitled The Rise and Fall of Human Rights, Cynicism and Politics in Occupied Palestine, 2013, uh, also published by Stanford University Press. Clearly, Dr. Allen, you like uh, optimistic and hopeful subject matters <laughs> in your research. And with that introduction, I will uh, give you the stage to uh, give us what I understand will be a short presentation for 25 minutes, and then I'll uh, follow up afterwards with uh, my set of questions. So take it away, please, thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Tafi, for inviting me to talk with you and to Maggie and CBRL for the opportunity. And thanks to all of you who have joined this afternoon or evening. Um, do forgive me for looking down at you. I have to stand sometimes when my back is feeling a bit wonky. It's um, not a metaphor for anything. So Maggie will be uh, kindly moving through the slides for me. Um, so do forgive my prompts to her. So A History of False Hope offers an anthropological chronicle of the long history of investigative commissions in Palestine, starting in 1919 and going essentially up until today. There have been tens of commissions to Palestine. The British love to send them. Um, but so has the UN. And here's a partial list, Maggie, next slide. I focus in my book on six commissions of inquiry as a way of tracing the history of liberalism and international law in Palestine over a century. Each of these commissions has been a kind of staging of a different era of international law. And what the book presents is a essentially a critique of liberalism and international law as they have produced a long history of false hope to Palestinians and those wishing for justice in Palestine. 
liberalism and international law promise justice, fairness, balance, equality before the law. They promise democracy. We can see today that these promises have yet to be fulfilled. An important premise of the book is that these investigative commissions are a kind of staging of international law and the liberal values on which international law rests. The commissions are not officially legal with courtroom standards of evidence, but they are very legalistic. They involve legal experts, often including judges, lawyers. They involve the presentation of evidence and they bring people together into a kind of spectacle of international law and performance values. So these commissions are the lens through which I examine international law over this century. The first commission I examine is the King Crane Commission of 1919. This group of American scholars and businessmen, Maggie, let me send the next slide up. These people came to Palestine as the Ottoman Empire had crumbled and a new international order of ethno-nationalism was coming into place under the League of Nations. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson asked the commission to elucidate the state of opinion in what was known as Greater Syria, including Palestine. And he wanted to know, um, or he claimed to want to know, what the Arabs wanted for a new government or mandatory power. Another commission, next slide, that I look at is the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry of 1946, which came at the end of World War II. The Anglo-American Committee examined the position of Jews in relation to the question of Palestine, and it came in a period marked by a shift toward the politics of humanitarianism. I also examined a UN special committee that started investigating the human rights situation of the occupied Palestinian territory in around 1969, and the Mitchell Committee. Next slide. Uh, this committee brought together the US, Turkey, European countries, Norway, to investigate the start of the Second Intifada in the year 2000. Since 2000, several UN entities have emerged as central to Palestinian politics. The Human Rights Council is a major forum in which the UN addresses human rights and humanitarian crises, and it has become the body most active in forming investigative commissions in Palestine and elsewhere. Although the UN has sent many commissions to Palestine, it's really the Goldstone Commission that has been by far the most controversial. And Maggie, if you want to go to the next slide, here are some images of South African Judge Richard Goldstone, the head of this committee. And this is the last commission that my book examines. It was launched in the wake of Israel's assault on Hamas in the Gaza Strip in December 2008, January 2009, the so-called Operation Cast Lead. And the Goldstone Commission is particularly interesting for how it highlighted the category of international crime in discussions of Israel's treatment of Palestinians. And um, with this anti-impunity turn, reignited some Palestinian hope in international law yet again. So each commission has consisted of a group of experts of one kind or another, including academics, lawyers and judges, legislators, diplomats, and each was charged by a government or coalition of governments with investigating a specific set of circumstances, usually prompted by um, a period of intensified violence. In general, they are tasked with understanding the reasons for violence and making recommendations for how to reach a political solution. Commissions are a form of international intervention, a tool of global governance, a forum for the incitement of discourse and knowledge production about Palestine and the conflict with Israel. So with each of these commissions, I explore how Palestinians and other advocates have sought to mobilize international law in pursuit of national independence and in their arguments calling for an end to Israel's occupation. Really, this book, A History of False Hope, emerged out of my curiosity about how and why the so-called question of Palestine has been so entwined with international law for so long. With international law, you know, it clearly has not produced any just solution for Palestinians or the peoples of the region. I see this book as being a kind of a prequel to my first book, next slide, Mehdi, The Rise and Fall of Human Rights that um, Tofik mentioned with cynicism in the title. And this was, um, is an ethnography of the human rights world in Palestine. The story in that book reached back just to the 1970s and tracked the increasing entrenchment of a human rights imagination in Palestinian politics and society 
throughout the first and second intifadas and throughout the evolution of the Palestinian Authority. And I was struck by how ubiquitous the work and words of the human rights system were among Palestinians living under military occupation. And that first book explores how that came to be and analyzes some of its mostly negative effects. But what I did not answer in that first book was the question of how such an apparently ineffective system stayed so entrenched. You know, why did people invest such hope in human rights when the human rights system could do so little to impact the political structures that maintained their own freedom? That was a question that emerged in the midst of my fieldwork in the West Bank, but I never really found an answer to it in that earlier research. You know, one of the standard narratives about the human rights system is that it really took off and came to supplant other usually leftist politics in the 1970s and 80s with the fall of the Soviet Union, so this narrative goes, human rights and politically driven sympathy for the suffering victims came to displace more ideologically driven politics. But that was not really a, a fully satisfying answer to my questions about the roots of human rights politics in Palestine and the strength of the human rights system's hegemony. You know, Palestinians and their supporters have been going to the United Nations for decades and to the UN's predecessor, the League of Nations, before that, making national and human rights claims since the beginning of the 20th century to no avail. So A History of False Hope is my attempt to find better answers, I guess, to this somehow mysterious attachment to the human rights system and the liberal internationalism of which, of which it is a fundamental part. And this meant digging back in time. International investigative commissions were really the perfect vehicle by which to examine a much longer history since these commissions have been going to Palestine and organizing and operationalizing international and human rights law since the conflict with Zionism began. Next slide, please. So for example, with the first commission I look at, the King Crane Commission, the focus of Arab representatives was on international legal principles, you know, self-determination, protection of minorities, relying on the promises inherent within international law in their claims. In a petition from a self-described Christian and Muslim delegation of Southern Syria known as Palestine, they expressed hope that the Zionist claims, quote, might be shattered asunder through our infallible proofs. They called on the Paris Peace Conference that was you know, deciding what to do at the end of the Ottoman Empire, not to encourage Zionism and its, quote, religious fundamentalism. They submitted the petition to the King Crane Commission, quote, with the full hope that these, our arguments and proofs, will receive due consideration and that our rights to our home will be confirmed. So notice this connection between proof and hope, right? This idea that legal proof and argumentation is enough to produce a just solution. Equal status for religious minorities featured centrally in how the Arab petitioners described their longed for independent state. They explained to the King Crane Commission that in their future state, since the native Jews, like the Christians were a religious minority, they would be considered citizens with equal rights and duties. What the Palestinian representatives rejected was the idea that Jews were a distinct national people entitled to unique um, political rights. But Arab hopes in international law and the liberals who proselytized it were disappointed. Um, despite the Arabs' uniform demands for absolute independence uh, that the King Crane Commission recorded, the great powers granted the mandate of Palestine to the British, as you all probably know, which ruled it under the aegis of the League of Nations until Israel gained an independent state in most of the territory in 1948. So that's just one example I recount in my book of how Palestinians put their faith in international law, had hope that the international community would respect their rights and be persuaded by their international legal arguments. I think a main conclusion of my book is also its premise that commissions of inquiry are a fascinating lens onto Palestinian political history in a transnational frame because each of these commissions brings a really diverse international group of people together to debate what's going on in Palestine and what role law and liberalism should in fact play. So they reveal a picture 
um, that really runs contrary to a lot of the standard histories and polemics about Israel-Palestine that normally report and condemn Palestinians' refusals to agree to bad deals for partial autonomy and partition of their country. But my history of commissions shows that there have been a string of Palestinian efforts to proffer democratic solutions to the so-called question of Palestine. You know, how many today know or could even be induced to believe that Palestinians had detailed plans in place for a democratic Palestine with constitutional guarantees of equal citizenship for all, Jew and Muslim and Christian in 1919, again in 1946, right? So let me give you an example. And this is part of the presentation to the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry in 1946. Um, Maggie, next slide. The Arab people has again and, sorry, has again and again emphasized that the only just and practicable solution for the problem of Palestine lies in the constitution of Palestine into a self-government governing state with its Arab majority, but with full rights for the Jewish citizens, a state which should enter the United Nations on a level of equality with other Arab states, a state in which questions of general concern like immigration should be decided by the ordinary democratic procedure in accordance with the will of the majority. The government they proposed would be, quote, representative of all Palestinian citizens on a level of absolute individual equality. This statement exemplifies these liberal views that I'm talking about being such a consistent thread throughout Palestinian political history. The next slide is um, Albert Harani, who was the lead author of the Palestinian presentation to this commission. As the Arab office of which Harani was a part and which organized the presentation for this commission, as they laid out their vision, they emphasized the rights of Jews who were already in the country as legal citizens. This vision for the future was one in which Palestinian citizens, Arabs and Jews alike, would have responsibility of the welfare of the whole people of the country. And that's the quote from the Palestinians' presentation. Other documents that they submitted outlined the formation of the government uh, through constitutional and legislative assemblies. They had a provision for an electoral law and other guarantees that should be, they said, embodied in a UN General Assembly resolution. And in the next slide, there's an image of Frank Eidelot, an American member of the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry with Albert Einstein, who gave testimony to that commission. So the, the thing is, in the Arabs' testimonies and submissions to this committee, sympathetic acknowledgement of the humanitarian dimension of the Jewish situation was universal leaders in various Arab countries offered to open their doors to Jewish immigration. In Horani's testimony, he said he felt, quote, deeply and personally the suffering of the Jew. And these expressions were not limited to performances in front of the committee either. Um, Musa Alami, who was a Palestinian political independent and head of the Arab office that was advocating for Palestinian rights, contended that the refugee problem was a universal one. The Arabs were willing to contribute their share to solving it, he said, but they could not do so before they had achieved their political rights. So my point here is that there is little record of the Zionists and Westerners' refusals to agree to democratic solutions, even as Palestinians have been presenting them through the language of international law for over a century. Now, it isn't my book's main purpose, um, but it, a History of False Hope is also a chronicle of those refusals and the liberal excuses that have been given for them. You know, in the end, the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry issued a report that called for a huge increase of Jewish immigration to Palestine that would basically help cement Zionist control in the country. So Albert Parani and the Palestinians' presentations of international legal principles were not enough to convince the Committee of Palestinians' Rights in the country. It's important to understand that I examine this history of investigative commissions in their social context, not specifically their reports, which I think have been, you know, that maybe sometimes the least interesting aspect of these commissions of inquiry. So I look at them in a more kind of dynamic and ethnographic way. I've observed how a huge variety of people have interacted with these commissions, how Palestinians and their advocates have tried to make their political case to the international community via these commissions. And this has included everyone from 
official political representatives to lawyers, NGO and human rights activists, to regular you know, unaffiliated people, fishermen and farmers and housewives. All kinds of people have been brought into the orbit of international legal discourse via these commissions. In reading the archives to write my book, I noticed pictures, for example, of whole families coming to make their case for Palestinian independence to the King Crane Commission. Um, next slide, please. And you can see here an example and the, the you know, kind of raggedy clothes indicating their status. And again, this is just another indication of how widespread has been the investment of people in these international legal processes. And I also read the testimonies given by school teachers and grandfathers and political prisoners to UN investigators in the 1970s and more recently. And what this research has revealed over and over across a century of history is that engaging the human rights system, making their case to its arbiters has mattered to a lot of people in Palestine. Now, I don't have time to go into to detail, but what's evident in Palestinians' testimony to the many later investigations that the UN and other government coalitions have sent is that they each reignited a vigorous hope in that world body and the power of international law, hope in a world working in the service of human rights. You know, as one witness from the West Bank told the UN committee in 1974, the UN gave him, quote, at least a ray of hope for us in the future of humanity. Exchanges between Palestinians and their investigators are full of such announcements of hope, continually expressing their belief in a humanity with a conscience. These are expectations that the international community will put an end to their suffering. The international community through these commissions encourages these expectations. As I mentioned in 2009, South African judge Richard Goldstone explained the goal of the UN commission he was heading. Next slide, please. He said, quote, the aim is to allow victims and survivors on all sides to speak for themselves to the international community. One of the survivors they heard from was a man from the Gaza Strip who lost 11 members of his family to Israeli shelling. He told Goldstone, quote, what we hope is that you will portray the picture as you have seen it. And we hope that the criminal will be held accountable for his crimes. Israel and the occupation army have perpetrated every single war crime in the books, the houses, the trees, the children, the schools, the mosques. So his was a bitter hope. And this in a way is one of my main conclusions that these commissions reassert to lots of people the primacy of international legal systems as a means to justice in Palestine in repeatedly bringing a wide range of Palestinians together to try to convince the international community that they deserve independence, that they deserve their individual and collective rights. In doing so, each commission has excited a level of hope in international law, in liberal systems, in the international community. Um, you know, there have been varying levels of hope to be sure, but still there is always a hope. In making their case, Palestinians have invoked, but don't always rely on international documents and legal norms. Sometimes they've called them directly into question. Um, in the next slide, Maggie, there's an image of Ahmed Shukairi with a quote from his testimony to the Anglo-American Committee in 46. I must make it clear that our right is not based on treaty or pledge. As we know, pledges are often framed with back doors and loopholes. I shall not refer to Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, nor to President Wilson's 12th point, nor do I intend to refer to the King Crane Commission of 1919 or to the Atlantic Charter. These instruments recognize but do not create our right to independence. If the recognition is withheld, our right still remains and shall remain. In this rhetorically clever testimony of Shukheri, the future head of the PLO offers a critique of the malleable and political nature of human-made law. But there is always nevertheless hope that this time might be different, that the powers that be might finally listen to reason, to legal reason, that they might finally offer a just solution that recognizes Palestinian primacy in their land. And each time these hopes have been disappointed. So one conclusion is that international law, these liberal systems on their own, are simply not sufficient for achieving justice and may in some ways even be a hindrance. With each new commission, there's a new context, a new focus, a new set of terms 
by which Palestinians have been judged, by which they have had to prove their liberal credentials. And this leads me to a third main point of the book and a final point that I'll make in my comments just now about the shifting nature of these commissions and international law over the past century. What they demanded kept changing these commissions, but also what kept changing was what they offered. So first in terms of demands, Palestinians had to initially show that they were a nation. They had to prove their national identity and national coherence to the King Crane Commission. And then they had to show that they weren't too nationalist, that they were reasonable, compromising, and sympathetic towards the Jewish victims of the Europeans' Holocaust. And then we shift again in the 60s and 70s when there's a change at the UN, when increasing numbers of um, recently decolonized peoples gained a voice in the UN General Assembly and third world solidarity really becomes much louder and seemingly powerful at the UN. At this point, international human rights and humanitarian law is held up as a basis for condemning Israel's actions in the occupied territory but Palestinian citizens of Israel kind of get left behind in this discourse. And from then onwards, the UN has been the most prolific dispatcher of commissions and international human rights and humanitarian law are their reference points. And throughout, Palestinian representatives to these commissions have held firm to these principles, to arguing their case within those international legal terms. And then the language of war crimes and anti-impunity emerges as another kind of hook as the International Criminal Court becomes another venue for Palestinian legal claims. What this long anthropological historical approach shows is how each new iteration of international law's promises reaches out to new generations, reinciting faith in the existence of an international community that cares, prompting belief in the notion that law can be an objective arbitrator. Through each commission, in each historical era, we see specific demands made of Palestinians who are urged to perform an ever-shifting range of sentiments from properly contained nationalist passion to humanitarian sympathy, balance and compromise to hope and sincere suffering. And I tease out all of these demands across these um, commissions that I write about in the book. Although the continually shape-shifting criteria end up being impossible to fulfill, each permutation offers a new opportunity for Palestinians to you know, grasp at carrots being dangled seemingly just for them because the rules of international law demand an end to their colonial confinement. You know, new assurances of globally dispersed democracy and new audiences that promise empathetic listening inspire hope that the latest manifestation of the international community will live up to its liberal ideals. This is the part um, of the power of international law as ideology, which is kind of a fundamental premise of the book. So to conclude, I want to just return for a second to the Goldstone Commission. When the Palestinian president deferred discussion of the Goldstone Report at the UN, he came under widespread criticism, some of you may remember. A Hamas commentator at the time wrote that by freezing the report, the president, quote, simply picked up the phone and erased the Palestinians, end quote. You know, for a people whose nationalism has centered on proving their existence as a collective political subject deserving of sovereignty, this equation of a UN report with an existential affirmation is significant. It tells us something of the reach of these commissions, which brings even those not typically considered liberal into their liberal framework. Despite the repeated failures of commissions and the international legal regime they represent, legalism, this idea that the objective rules of law can produce fair results, you know, this idea that law is universally accessible um, to all and equally, that law can be a break on power, liberal legalism continues to pull Palestinians and others into engaging, engaging with these adjudicating processes fundamental liberal principles such as democracy and self-determination, freedom, progress, have come to be the exclusive provenance of some, but still constitute an ideology that sutures those excluded from it, the dominated, into its web of aspirations. So I'll end there now and look forward to our discussion. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Laurie, for uh, a fascinating uh, presentation, which I think gives our readers or our audience. <laughs> and a, hopefully uh, readers. Yeah. And hopefully readers, <laughs> indeed. A, um, a, you know, I think it does a great job of giving insight into what you've looked at. Uh, from its from its title, one might think that this is a book that has that is is a his, historical book that is going through the politics of these commissions. What I was surprised at when I actually started reading the book was the the fact that uh, uh, you're an anthropologist and it it has a lot of anthropology involved in the text. So uh, this was sort of very immediate to me when I started reading, and, and it's a very effective tool, I would argue, because it adds a lot of nuance. Uh, but uh, can I ask you to perhaps extrapolate on what the anthropologist's lens actually contributes to a study of something that is, on, in principle, something that is very formalistic and legalistic, so to speak? Right, yeah, thanks. Thanks for noticing the anthropological details. Um, I am an anthropologist and it took a, a big um, leap of confidence to put history in my title. Uh, but yes, you know, I and my amazing large number of research assistants did a ton of research into um, the archives as a way of finding the anthropological details of the characters I write about. Um, we read Arabic newspapers, uh, the personal papers and memoirs of some Western investigators, as well as Palestinians and others who presented uh, to the commissions. I read people's letters and their diaries. Um, lots of letters written into newspapers as people debated how to present their political demands to, for example, the King Crane Commission. Uh, also lots of debates among diplomats at the UN as Palestinians and many others argued and you know, made claims for Palestinian rights. And I read the testimony also of Palestinians to uh, different commissions. And um, for the later commissions, I in fact talked with people who presented to investigators who um, organized invest, um, presentations to the investigators. And all of this was to understand their motivations, what they thought they might achieve. And, and then with these more recent fact-finding missions, I've talked with people to um, you know, lawyers and so on, and the people who wrote legal briefs to try to understand how international law became a kind of article of faith and also to understand the limits of that faith as well. And, and what I hope to discover through this was a kind of subaltern history of international law, right? A, a view of international law from below to see how, yes, political people, but also you know, representatives, professionals, and all kinds of regular people engage with international legal values and institutions. Um, and taking this anthropological approach, this is a more kind of grassroots way of understanding the normativity of human rights, by which I mean, you know, a way of understanding how human rights and international law have become so influential, not just at the state or international level, but at the level of individual folks and, and how people imagine politics. You know, regular people who place their hopes of, you know, again, at different levels, but do place their hopes in these international bodies. Um, and, you know, similarly for liberalism, the book shows how liberalism is a lived ideology through this kind of anthropological approach, you know, by paying attention to how people talk, write, who they try to convince and in what terms, what their emotions and performances are. By looking at all of that, the book also traces the development of forms of liberal subjectivity. You know, the power of liberalism, like any ideology, is, is inheres in how its existence becomes a material force, an embodied way that people um, are living in the world. So A History of False Hope seeks to concentrate attention on those dynamics of everyday liberalism, of how people um, understand the strength um, of, of international law and its grip on, on people who suffer from it, right? And so through, in each of these commissions, in each historical era, we see different demands being made of Palestinians who are urge to perform this ever shifting range of sentiments. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier how there were periods when Palestinians were expected to perform their properly contained nationalist passion and other times it was humanitarian sympathy. So it's, it's that kind of, I mean, that's, I guess, what the anthropologist brings is a sense of um, 
how people are both living these ideologies and values and also how they are dealing with the kinds of demands being made of them, right? Um, and, and with liberalism, you know, specific behaviors are constantly required, modes of speech, of polite speech, professional speech, social interactions are judged in particular ways and pronouncements are made according to these particular but shifting criteria, right? So the acceptable liberal subject must evince among other senses a reasoned, rational, tolerant way of being, right? The acceptable liberal subject must be, depending on the moment, sufficiently nationalist and patriotic, but not too much so. They must be industrious, not insistent or tedious. They have to be willing to compromise and forgive, um, professional and polite. All of these kinds of stances that are required, and we can see these ever-shifting criteria, um, at how they're held out in these different commissions. So, it's really by paying attention to these kinds of emotional and social interactions between people during commission hearings, in their arguments in, that they exchanged in newspapers uh, and other writings, that we can see what international law and liberalism have meant to people and how they've really shaped their thoughts and hopes. Thank you for that. Uh, answer, fantastic answer. I guess I'd uh, like to try and pick up on this uh, that for performative aspects of these commissions, both in so far as they act as performances for liberal international legalistic orders, as well as for a stage for the Palestinians to uh, do their own kinds of performance, uh, which has different audiences as well. And I think also you tend to acknowledge uh, fairly frankly in the book at uh, several stages that there are declared and undeclared dimensions to, there's a, dual, a dualism to uh, these performances on both sides. Uh, given the fact that you studied so many of these, I mean, I think if, we, if I added them all up, you had around 23 or 24 commissions that you looked at. I'm not sure if you looked at all of them so much in depth. I'm sure that was a lot of paperwork to uh, go through as <laughs> with every <laughs> event that ends up coming here, you end up seeing the amount of research that's generated in, in paper trails is astonishing especially in the last 25 years. And that's also been a, a very busy time for these kinds of commissions as well. But in any case, I'd uh, given the fact that you have the benefit of having studied the, the arc of these performances over time, can you speak to, uh, you know, things that, uh, more dynamics around, uh, around what shaped them and uh, particularly the declared and undeclared dimensions that are not just evidenced in the, uh, in the, in the linguistic or the, the micro that you were talking about? Yeah, yeah. So um, thanks for that. I think there are a couple of examples that illustrate this in really interesting, frankly, frustrating ways. <laughs> um, one is the Mitchell Committee that came to Palestine during the Second Intifada. But the first one I want to talk about is um, from the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, uh, which, as I mentioned, went to Palestine in 1946. Um, it also went elsewhere to explore the situation of the displaced Jews and to explore it in relation to, to Palestine and Zionism, in fact. And what really, really struck me in my reading of how this committee dealt with the Palestinians and other Arabs who provided testimony um, was how unwilling they really were to listen to Arab liberal claims and democratic discourse, how unwilling they were to see most of these people as making rational arguments, because instead, they were actually looking for a different kind of liberal performance. Um, that showed sympathy for the plight of Jews at its center, right? So despite Palestinians' assertions that the humanitarian crisis of the Jews did need to be solved, but not at their expense, despite this, members on the Anglo-American Committee were mostly you know, unimpressed by the Arabs that appeared before them. Um, the Westerners dismissed their case as being you know, basically boring and a repetition of the standard Arab arguments that Palestine was Arab and the Jews were interlopers. That's, um, I pulled up a quote from one of what the committee members had said to dismiss the Arab claims. You know, the Americans and the British did not interpret the Arab arguments about self-determination as a principled and consistent political stance, but instead they dismissed it as being rigid and unimaginative, right? They found the Arabs to be intransigent and they thought what, that what they presented was overstatement. And, and you can read in their diaries and their letters to their wives' home that they found it distasteful, right? And this is where you get to the kind of unspoken 
um, ways that people were judging each other. One commissioner, this guy, James McDonald, was actually an avowed Zionist. Um, I mean, it was known that he was a Zionist um, supporter, but he ended up on the committee anyway. And he took every chance to dismiss the Arabs' testimony. He called them intransigent so many times in his diaries that I stopped recording the instances. Um, he wrote in his diary, for example, um, and let me pull up another quote. He said, um, on the whole, the Arabs made an impression of such unyieldingness that it would be impossible to win them by any sort of compromise, right? So there are all of these kind of blanket um, um, dismissals of their political arguments based on these other kinds of criteria. Other commissioners did have uh, begrudging words of praise, I guess, for Albert Porani. Um, they were you know, impressed by his eloquence, his intelligence, but you can read in the back and forth with him that his testimony was weakened, his credibility was tarnished because he fell short on expressing enough sympathy for the Jews, basically. He neglected to express it in the right way at the right moment. So there was this moment when one of the commissioners questioned him on the Arabs' demand that Jewish immigration to Palestine stop. Um, and the commission secretary reported that Horani would not agree to the admission of a single additional Jew to Palestine you know, not even the aged and infirm among the displaced people. But the fact is that the Arab stance was really clear. The doors of Europe and America should be open to the victims of the European war, right? Not the politically fragile Holy Land. The Arabs recommended that the refugee problem should be adjudged by the United Nations at the equal expense of all its members. And that's what they said in their presentation. And that was what was ignored. Right. What struck the committee was this, you know, intransigence rather than Korani's argument. The commissioners were reading, um, maybe reading what they wanted to see in the emotional and rhetorical performances of the Arab presenters. Um, and as I write in my book, I, I kind of describe this as being a humanitarian structure of feeling that formed the way that Westerners discuss the issue at this time. This deployment of humanitarianism trumped Palestinians' legal liberal arguments. Palestinians didn't adhere enough or in the right way to these humanitarian demands because they were continuing to express their commitment to the ideology of international law, right? But World War II had created these conditions in which sympathy for suffering would become a core virtue of liberalism. And this committee, the Anglo-American Committee, really reveals how the correct expression of sympathy for Jewish suffering became a performative requirement of the good liberal. Um, I can talk about another example from the Mitchell Committee. I don't know if I'm going to should, should, should go ahead. Go ahead. Of that. Yeah. So, we're um, so this one is really fascinating. It was just incredible to be able to talk to people who were involved with this one. I interviewed um, Senator George Mitchell, a bunch of his staff people, the Americans. I talked to the Norwegian delegation. Um, so I got pretty first-hand views from the committee staff, as well as from, as from the Palestinians who presented to the committee and organized the presentation. So um, again, just to remind people, this is the committee that came at the second Intifada, um, and it included Americans, British, EU, um, Norwegians, uh, former president of Turkey, to try to understand the causes of the second Intifada and supposedly provide a road back to the peace process. And what was really so interesting talking to both the Palestinian representatives and the commission members and the staff was how they read Palestinian presentations. They were all really, first of all, really impressed by, and probably frankly in a somewhat racist way, some of them were surprised to be impressed by, the Palestinians' professionalism. Um, this was the work mostly of the uh, negotiation support unit, which had been formed to support the Palestinian leadership in negotiations. And it was mostly Palestinians or Palestinians from the diaspora legal um, professionals who um, had been supporting the leadership. And then when the breakdown in peace talks happened, they took over the presentation to the Mitchell Committee. And so what the Palestinians performed very well, and I don't say performed as, a, as in it being a, a false performance, I'm saying that it was how they interacted with people, um, was in a very professional way. And they put a lot of effort into producing written statements to the committee that were very steeped 
in international human rights and humanitarian law. And it was, you know, the language that made sense to them as lawyers and which they thought would make sense to George Mitchell, who was a former judge and the other committee members who were all, you know, diplomats and, and legal people. But what many of the committee staff members remembered, especially the Americans that I talked to, were the more emotional performances that they saw. Um, they were more struck by the Palestinians and Israelis who had lost loved ones in the violence, right? And in fact, they saw the legal documents as so much you know, cold, dry paper, and one of them sent this to me. So here again, we see Palestinians performing or you know, producing and being very committed to, in fact, international legal principles, only to have that in a lot of ways dismissed. And of course, what the Mitchell Committee report came up with in the end was a language of both sides, right? Where Palestinian representatives, um, they were trying to impose these international legal principles as the correct framework for determining a resolution to the conflict. The Mitchell Committee patiently recognized the fear and hate and anger and frustration that have arisen on both sides, right? So while Palestinians describe their position um, as responding to Israeli allegations with facts and evidence and lots of statistics, and they insisted on legal obligations um, that flow from Israel's role as an occupying power, all of this legal stuff, uh, the committee, the Mitchell Committee in their report encouraged Palestinians and Israelis to appreciate each other's problems and concerns, right? So as I write in my book, this interchange ended up being the kind of dialogue of the deaf as the language of international law from Palestinians was deflected by a committee of what I call democratic listeners who prioritized the enactment of liberal communicative ideals over the assertion of legal principles. Fascinating, thank you so much, Lori. Um, I wanna invite our, read our, our readers, I keep on saying readers, our listeners, please <laughs> put their questions in the question and answer uh, tab or button at the bottom of their screens while I ask uh, Dr. Allen an, uh, another question. Um, uh, this last question kind of picks up from part, part, some of the things that you were talking about previously in regards to particularly the Palestinian dimension of when they were performing their sort of argument. Uh, and I, one of the, uh, you know, I find it quite an, a very interesting and, and valuable contribution to have captured uh, sort of the, the Arab interlocutors with this dynamic and what they were able to achieve because I, because uh, they belie many expectations or ideas about what the Palestine, Palestinians or Arabs have been up to and how they've tried to use law or whether they qualify within uh, liberal paradigms or not, you know. Uh, but with, with that said, uh, I don't want to focus specifically on them. I think, although I think there is uh, future work to be done on this category of, of the, the, the folks, especially because, I mean, you really pull it back to the 20s and 30s and carry on this trajectory of following this class of people all the way into the 80s and even till today, you're talking about the NSU. Uh, but uh, I think w one of the Im important sort of legacies of these people is what they were able to do through the United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission. And, and uh, uh, you, you, you described how this was one of the major uh, uh, repositories of, uh, of where it, international investigations come from these days and, and how in many cases they, they built the Palestinian case through the, this vehicle and it, wa it was an apparatus for them to be able to actually test international law. And it got me thinking about the extent to which the Palestinian case study has actually contributed to the UN itself in its expression as an institution trying to fulfill its mission around international legal, liberal legal norms that how, how uh, Constitu constitutive has the Palestinian case study been towards for the UN in regards to its own raison d'etre? Mm. That's, that's a really good question. It's a big question. And frankly, I think there's another book to be written about the mutually constitutive nature of Palestine and the UN. So for those of you in the audience looking for book projects, we've just given you two. One is about Palestinian liberalism through history and the other is about Palestine and the UN, and you know, of course the UN is um, a giant complex and non-unified body, um, and also it's an inconstant one, right? Many bits of it have spent uh, 
an inordinate amount of energy on Palestine from UNRWA to OCHA to ESWA and all of the other acronyms, um, the member, the, I mean, the number of UN resolutions and reports and controversies around Palestine and Israel in the UN is countless. And one thing my book tries to show is the kind of shifts in the zeitgeist of global governmentality via the UN through which conflict, um, in fact, throughout the global south has been, been managed. Um, and although international law has remained kind of baseline of Palestinian engagement with the international community, what commission investigators really focused on shifted, as, as I said in my earlier comments. Um, but I think maybe I could answer your question by, by focusing on a particular period, a specific historical example. One of the chapters of my book focuses on a UN special committee that began in 1969. And it's issued, it has issued a report every year since then on the human rights situation in the occupied Palestinian territory. And it got some attention in the early years, but it's kind of blended into the background of the deluge of human rights reports that have come out over the years. But there was something really interesting in the 1960s and 70s. For Palestinians, transformations at the UN and this period prompted, basically prompted hope for better results from international law yet again, because the UN General Assembly was where a growing number of recently decolonized nations really started to rally together to produce anti-colonial and anti-racist international legal innovation. Um, you know, it prompted a renewed optimism that the liberal legal order might finally include them as Palestinians, as a people, as an equal and independent state. You know, by, by 1963, there was something like 34 African states that in a membership of 113 at the UNGA. And um, so that was this big development. In 1960, the, the UN Declaration on Granting Independence to Colonial Countries and peoples had come out. So my point is that there's this new context in which uh, a more third world agenda was really coming to the fore, right? And so I read um, how much real genuine optimism there was among Palestinians and their kind of third world solidarity cohort um, and how they put Palestinian demands for rights really at the center of discussion at the UNGA in this period. and. Um, you see the, the, the people who understood experientially the, un, the, the, the evils of colonialism and racism and apartheid, um, you see them you know, trying to uproot these things through the UNGA. And in a way, the UN came to symbolize a new version of the international community and its solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. The GA was a really vociferous body that articulated um, Palestinian rights and solidarity with it. And it was a space of debate in which, you know, national representatives and regular people contested um, the significance of international law. And, and we really start to see how the UNGA and the Palestinian problem came to be talked about as almost synonymous. People, these representatives, these delegates understood that the UN could mean nothing if they could not support Palestinian independence or Palestinian human rights. So that's just one example of how people themselves saw the interlinking of the UN and um, the, 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 the question of Palestine or the problem of Palestine. Um, but the fact is, right, that despite all of these words of solidarity, and I read a lot of them, and it's really fascinating reading, but the fact is that the words um, did not really develop into enough material support to make a dent in Israel, um, in the occupation. Um, and it suggests that the UNGA and international law and third world solidarity, in the end, they just ended up being talking shops. Uh, they couldn't or didn't coalesce into meaningful political pressure. So if that also is a reflection on what the UN is, um, I leave that for, for you and other readers to decide. <laughs> Well, let me steal one more last question uh, or answer out of you and also encourage our listeners to uh, put their questions up because we're going to go to their questions right after my last question, uh, uh, which has to do with the, perhaps where you left off right there, which has to do with, okay, uh, when it comes to Palestine, we've seen all these investigations. The question of culpability is obviously a big issue right now. And you mentioned in your presentation, as well as your book, that the Goldstone Commission, Committee or the Commission 
perhaps began to introduce a new set of sort of tools or, uh, uh, or it put the, brought the idea of war crimes to the forefront, which actually I was about surprised that it hadn't actually taken place before because there was no shortage of potential cases before. But in any case, 2008, 2009, or Goldstone is actually 10, I guess it's, it, comes, it comes afterwards. Uh, uh, I, I guess I want to test uh, to what extent uh, the commissions post Goldstone have begun to evidence or, or are we are we are we indeed getting closer to uh, uh, the ability to uh, take tangible kinds of action that can be that can render some forms of justice through through, through these international bodies through things like the, these investigative commissions, or is it simply the reproduction of more false hope? I mean, what can you be telling our re your re our listeners today? when they see, hear about the next investigative commission to Palestine, which may be coming around the corner given what just happened in the last month or so, uh, to, to, to give them tools to be able to understand whether what we're witnessing is the attempt to reproduce more false hope or actually has some teeth to it. Right, thank you for that. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, and there is another commission actually that was just established in May after um, the most recent events. And this is going to be, um, a, a standing kind of permanent commission, and it looks like it'll be very similar to previous ones. But I think what's distinctive about this one and about this moment is the context, right? And this, I think, is what we have to pay attention to. So, I mean, the, the kind of key argument of my book is that international law hasn't done much for Palestinians, for independence. It hasn't achieved justice in the region, and it cannot on its own. And there have been times when there might have been a, a sort of a crack in the hegemony. For example, during the Peel Commission of 1936, um, maybe during the Third World era uh, of, at the UN. But this was when there were greater, um, there was greater energy and solidarity energy that could have brought what international law was doing farther into the world to create actual political change. And so I think what's happening now is very interesting, not because the commission, this latest commission is going to achieve anything new on its own, but it's coming at a very unique conjuncture, or um, I think a special conjuncture in which, you know, we saw the amount of international solidarity for Palestinians um, during the latest conflict in Jerusalem or the efforts of the Israelis to displace people from their homes, we saw a form of solidarity that was, I think, um, new for a lot of people across uh, 48 Palestine among Palestinian citizens of Israel. We saw some of the biggest marches in London for Palestinian rights that we've ever seen. So there's this kind of solidarity that's building around immediate events. We've also been seeing grow over recent years, increasing amount of kind of um, African-American, Black Lives Matter kind of solidarity with Palestinians with, through a kind of shared understanding of um, how people are subject to militarized um, policing and state violence and new kinds of solidarity coming out there, BDS. And then there's been this whole new slew of conversation about Israel is an apartheid state, right? So you've got people like Alexandria um, Cortez, who calls Israel in a apartheid state. We've got Adala and Beit Salem and Human Rights Watch and al Haku and Sharashu, lots of new reports coming out, um, telling us again how Israel is like an apartheid state or is an apartheid state. At the same time that Israel is just putting its, <laughs> putting its Jewish supremacism right out there in the Jewish nation state law that you know, denies collective rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel, enshrines in law Jewish supremacism as a basis of the Israeli state. So together, this might constitute a kind of conjuncture in which enough different kinds of people and pressure are coming together, um, both pressures in solidarity with Palestinian rights and against Israeli actions. And maybe it can grow to be enough to, in order to, to shift the status quo. But a UN commission on its own isn't going to do that. It might be able to feed into this discourse, right? But I think there has to be a more concerted set of channels for um, 
coalescing those discourses, those arguments, those pushbacks, and make politicians who let Israel get away with what it gets away with suffer for letting it get away. They need to suffer at the ballot box and in their coffers and in public debate, right? Um, so, you know, I may not be, well, what's, what's the expression? Um, optimism of the will, what is it? Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So I think this is a moment though, where optimism of the will has some legs. Okay. Well, thank you for those reflections. Uh, we're gonna shift now to the questions from the audience. Uh, and we can tell that there is actually good interest in this topic. Uh, we have eight questions so far. I will just read it off the top here. Uh, the first question comes from one Carrie Abbott uh, regarding who says in regards to the focus of Mitchell, I guess the Mitchell committee on people to people angle uh, that this was introduced by Dennis Ross and others with donors as quote unquote peace building between individuals instead of a conflict resolution between peoples. It proliferates in conflict regions today as a way for anyone to do something to make peace without addressing the main issues of occupation, et cetera. However, it was noted by UN diplomats that the term, terms often were not the obstacle, the international legal issues, but ultimately the idea the other side did not appreciate their suffering, as in Palestine or Cyprus. The facts can be manip manipulated by people through their focus. There are always underlying issues and international law is used often as a last resort by the weaker party. Does it seem the party who invokes UN resolutions often has no other tools to access rights? This is a comment and a question. So okay, yeah, I put it yeah, on. yeah. No, thanks for that, Kerry. That that's a good comment and and a good question. And uh, I think that yeah, international law is often the um, not really a tool of last resort. Um, as my book shows, it's been a <laughs> a constant tool of first, second, and third resort, and constant resort. Um, and of course, it's for people who don't have political recourse or um, don't have other forms of pressure that they can put on the people in power, right? And I guess what I'm trying to show in the book is that there's been a lot of faith in international law as this form of um, a break on power, as, as something that could be mobilized as a break on power but it simply cannot be such without a broader political, um, a broader political mobilization to make that pressure have teeth because international law in a lot of ways um, is just a talking shop. I mean, I think that the International Criminal Court is um, really interesting for people because it holds out the possibility of actually putting someone in prison for what they've done to Palestinians, right? Um, so uh, international law can seem like a stronger tool than it is. And I guess that's been part of my critique is that it needs to, um, people who are interested in trying to advocate for Palestinian rights need to think about it in a broader, more complex context, I think. Right. Okay, uh, we're going to jump to a question by Yezen Duran, who asks a very interesting question. He says, I'm wondering if you could say something about how the commissions may have received Palestinian slash Arab liberalism. What you said about the different performances of liberalism on the part of the Palestinians suggests that their liberalism was usually regarded with some kind of suspicion i.e. that they are not sufficiently liberal or not genuinely so. If I'm correct to read this into what you're saying, what role did this suspicion play both in how the commissions made their recommendations and how Palestinians continue to be bound to the norms of liberalism, even in the face of its failure to deliver justice? Thank you, and thank you for that excellent question, Yazan. Yeah, fantastic question, Yazan. And it, it depends on which commission we're talking about um, and which commissioners we're talking about. So. I think in um, my comments to one of Taufik's questions, I mentioned how in the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, there was a kind of uh, a resistance to Palestinian or Arab liberalism or a refusal to really accept it or believe it um, and, and the, a quickness to dismiss Palestinians offers or other Arab leaders offers to provide an alternative solution for the suffering of the Jewish displaced people of Europe. So that was one example. 
Um, but like with the King Crane Commission, some of the liberal members on that committee were very convinced by the Arabs' um, demands for uh, independent Palestinian Arab uh, nation state. They believed them, some didn't. And so like William Yale, who's the commissioner I would love to hate, um, just could dismiss Palestinian nationalist claims based on whatever he pulled out of his hat. He just refused to listen to it, whereas some of the other people did. And, and in the end, that committee report, in fact, reflected the Arabs' demands for um, a, an Arab independent nation state in historic Palestine. Other things got in the way of that report having any effect, including Woodrow Wilson's illness, um, the British and French not wanting it to happen, and, uh, and so on. And then we can shift to, for example, the Mitchell Committee, where, as I said, a lot of the, um, in fact, all of the commission staff members and commissioners who I spoke with were unanimous in their appreciation for the, not just the professionalism of the Palestinians' presentations, but essentially their liberal ways. I mean, they might not have said those exact words, but it was um, kind of implied in the conversations I had with these people that um, they believed Palestinians' arguments and commitments to international law, but it isn't what ended up swaying them. International law was not what they wanted to happen. And again, outside events came, came in. Um, Bill Clinton left office. It was under Clinton that the Mitchell Committee came um, together. And George Bush came into power instead. And basically, it, it lost steam. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't ever mean to imply that it's just the um, success or lack of success of people's liberal performances that, that determined what happened next. That's, that's not what I'm trying to, to do or say. Um, these things always happen in very complex contexts. But the point is that even when the commissioners were convinced by these liberal performances, it still was not enough. To, um, to sway the results. Great, thank you. Uh, perhaps that's a good setup for Jesse Harrington's question, <laughs> who writes, uh, how much did geopolitical considerations influence the conclusions that these commissions arrived at? Events like the Russian Revolution, the Cold War, uh, oil interests? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm not a kind of international politics um, IR scholar. So it's not how I analyze these commissions, but for sure those contexts were contexts were relevant, right? So with the King Crane Commission, you've got indeed the, the, the Russian Revolution and you've got the Americans wanting to kind of perform their democracy and perform their um, anti-imperialist kind of stance. And that was part of what led Woodrow Wilson to form the King Crane Commission because it was, it was a committee that was going to ask the peoples of the Levant and elsewhere, you know, what kind of future government did they want? It was an exercise in self-government um, self and, and producing self-government or it was the pretense of such an exercise, right? And this was obviously, this was partly in, um, in, uh, in the context of a contest with what was happening in Russia, right? Um, the Anglo-American Committee, yes, this happened in the Cold War where you start to see a kind of a shift between the um, power of the British in the region towards the Americans. And so there was a lot of kind of um, shilly-shallying and dilly-dallying amongst the leaders of those countries trying to um, uh, use the commission in a way to deal with their own kind of um, diplomatic issues because the British were, um, they had really suffered from World War II economically, they needed American support and so forth. So of course these, these contexts always do play a role. Um, Excellent, no, important. Uh, but I understand of course it's very difficult to be able to bring that context in and recreate it for every commission that you're trying to describe. Uh, yeah. And I think you did, did well to uh, 
point to what you could on the more micro level, the granular level, rather than the macro, and let everybody else do their research. <laughs> but uh, okay, so uh, next question is actually from one Gabriel von Bruck, uh, who writes, for the first time in its history, the Knesset now has a human rights representative linked to one of the parties that are a part of the ruling coalition. Do you think that there is any hope that they will be taken into consideration in relation to Palestinian aspirations? Gabby, thank you. It's nice to see you in the Q&A. Gabby is a, a colleague. Um, and no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't suppose so. I think that, um, you know, there, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make with each one of the commissions that I look at and most of my analysis of, of human rights politics is that these languages, these values are important they do hold up standards. They do keep ideas like people shouldn't be tortured in the mix of acceptable um, demands, right? And I think that plays an important role, it plays an important moral role. And because the UN and these other authoritative bodies have, um, have endorsed these values, they do carry some kind of weight somehow, but, um, it's not how politics works, right? So I think any kind of, of, of language or representation that promotes Palestinian and, and any other rights um, and keeps them at the forefront of political demands and political discourse, that is important, um, but it won't achieve anything politically, as I've been saying, without lots of other things coming together. Okay, great. So I'm going to jump to the what could be our final question from Katrina Kamhawi, who writes, is the veto system in need of an overhaul within the UN? It seems that the majority of the world acknowledges the cruelty of Israel towards Palestinians, but uh, the veto gets in the way of reinforcing international law. Would yeah. you agree with that assessment? Is that what's needed? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I just, <laughs> I don't see it happening, right? So um, the UN was established by people who made sure that it would not have teeth, right? That it didn't, that it couldn't bite them in the ass. And, excuse my French. And um, I think that, I, I just can't imagine a situation in which um, people who have veto power or, or governments who have veto power um, would allow for it to be taken away. But yes, I think that it is a, it is a fundamental block in the actual implementation of international legal values and principles in international law. So I think it's a good right. idea. Can I ask you just, uh, it wasn't in the one of the questions, it hasn't come up in the question, in, question board, but uh, the question from Gabriel uh, previously sort of elicited it. The question around uh, Israel's approach to uh, investigative commissions. Can you give us a little bit of clarity on how they, how they and also for, I'm interested in perhaps two part question. One, the pre-state days, how they dealt with those commissions uh, uh, and then also perhaps the post uh, establishment of the state. Uh, I, I know you, you say that a lot of them, they actually have not uh, actually addressed or recognized uh, but still these reports are coming out. So if you could just give us a little background on how Israel has responded to these both pre-state and post-state. Right. Yeah, I mean, again, um, it depends on which era we're talking about. Um, and Israel has never been the focus of my research. So um, I, I don't wanna give short shrift to this answer. I can only answer the, the bits that I know. So for example, the Zionists, um, engaged very, very um, assiduously with the King Crane Commission and the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry. I mean, the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry had, they had moles, they, had, <laughs> they were really, really, really engaged in making sure that the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry understood their arguments and understood their perspective and understood their suffering. They were really engaged and really effective, really effective. Um, the King Crane Committee, you, you know, it was, there weren't as many Zionists around, but they also were engaged and made their presentation. 
but in Palestine, um, the Arab presentation was in fact really organized and really unified. And, um, and so there were some efforts to try to silence certain Arab representation and so on. There's, there's always this kind of shenanigans. Um, and then in the later commissions, uh, fact-finding missions that the UN has sent, it's become more and more common for Israel to simply um, refuse to engage, refuse to let the commissions enter um, the historic Palestine. They, um, with the Mitchell Committee, it was quite interesting because they engaged in this really weird slipshod way <laughs> that even the, the, um, the folks that I spoke with were, um, got the impression that the people who were involved in presenting to the Mitchell Committee weren't really um, all that um, engaged or committed to making even a, a really professional case. They just, they just didn't think it was worth it, it seems. Um, and then of course the UN commissions, they, the Goldstone Commission and so on, they, they, they discount the commissions, they try to show how they're biased, how the people involved are biased, how the UN is out to get them, and you know, that standard set of arguments is what gets trotted out each time. And they simply don't interact with the commissions. Um, um, or, or they might interact with the reports after they come out, but they don't engage um, with the commissions themselves. Now, of course, Israel has had their own history of commissions. Um, they've done their own, you know, every government does commissions, right? Every government tries to deal with um, problematic internal politics through commissions. So, you know, they had the Or Commission in 2000 when uh, Israel, um, Israeli police and security forces killed 13 Palestinians, 12 of them were Palestinian citizens of Israel people who were protesting um, in solidarity with the Intifada. Um, you know, they've, they've done their own commissions, but that's, that's a whole separate story. That's not really my story. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Allen. You've been listening to uh, uh, the Council for British Research in the Levant's uh, latest webinar and the Jerusalem book launch for a History of False Hope, Investigative Commissions in Palestine by Dr. Lori Allen. Uh, it's hot off the press from Stanford University Press just this, this year. And uh, pick yourself up a copy uh, and do so at the Educational Bookshop. I know the Educational Bookshop has a large clientele of internationals who uh, seem like they would need to read a, <laughs> this book very, very carefully. So uh, I encourage them to do so and pick up their copies from the Educational Bookshop on Salah Hadeen Street. As I said, this has been a webinar from the Council for British Research in the Levant coming to you from Jerusalem, from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Uh, please check out uh, uh, more webinars that we have done in the past, as well as what will be coming up in the future on our website. That's www.cbrl.ac.uk. Uh, a copy of this will also this recording of this recording will also be made available there, uh, and I would just like to thank our uh, our, uh, our presenter today, our guest today. That's what you are uh, for her book and her presentation, and uh, for the audience who who hung around for an hour and twenty minutes to hear all about it. And we actually kept most of our audience, so that's fantastic. Uh, for uh, your ability to keep your audience. So that's great news. And uh, have a great day and pick up a copy of this book. Thank you so much, Tafik. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks, CBRL, and everyone who, who joined us. Much appreciated. Ahla, Sahla. All the best. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.